Deuteronomy 32. Let's go there. Familiar passage for those of us that have been studying. This is the Song of Moses. The blessing. And there is a lot in here. He talks about the rock in verse 18. Of the rock that begat thee. Thou art unmindful. Thou hast forgotten God that formed thee. Boy, isn't that true sometimes. But then, he says in verse 31, their rock is not as our rock. Paul explaining to us that that rock was Christ, capital R, rock, in verse 31, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom. So, and the fields of Gomorrah. You heard me mention a church in this area. Um... In fact, there's several that I know of. I would have never, never dreamed this in my lifetime. That churches would ac openly acknowledge and allow sodomy to take in as members openly practicing Sodomites. So, a church just a few miles up the road, a lady that, I mean, I've known her for years and sort of had suspicions about her. Um, on her Facebook page, her and her wife taking many pictures together, raising their son. Now, I would say that I don't know how that happened. I don't want to know. But I can tell you that there are laboratories that have practiced turning the woman's seed into a man's seed or combining the DNA from two women to make a child. So that a child can be the product of two women. They can do that now. I don't think it's being done, you know, publicly to where, you know, there are clinics. But it can be done and more than likely will be done publicly. But this woman, married to this other woman, raising a son, belonging to this church, teaching the children's church, working in the vacation Bible school, openly practicing Sodom, sodomy. That's because the wine that they drink from is from the vine of Sodom. That's the fruit that it produces. So we have the vine, the, the vine of Sodom and John 15, the true vine. I am the true vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and my words abide in you. The same shall bring forth much fruit. It pleases the Father when God can use His people to bear the fruit that He gives us to bear. Amen? Amen. Pleases the Father. So... The, the vine that they're drinking from, that vine of NIV, Message, New American Standard, Christian Standard Version, and all these other Bibles that follow the Westcott Hort Greek text, the Bibles that have softened the language in these Bibles concerning the sin of sodomy, or in some cases just moved away from it so that churches now accepting practicing sodomites and in some cases those people leading the church 
One church in this area, the music minister, the choir director. Him and his wife divorced. She found out he was a sodomite. But for the kid's sake, she goes to that church. He goes to that church. He's the music minister. So she sits next to her boyfriend. He sits next to his boyfriend. And nothing's said. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So they're, but they don't understand that that vine that they're drinking from is poison. And it brings death, not life. So, their vine is the vine of Sodom, fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Uh, the young man, 32 years old, Referred to as zombie boy. Um, I don't have a picture to put up on the screen. You probably wouldn't want to see it anyway. But he's tattooed his body. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the most of certain types of tattoos. His, all of his body is tattooed. His face tattooed as a, as a skull. A lot of his chest area tattooed with bones, a skeleton. So he is a living dead man. Lady Gaga using him in one of her music videos. And the world calls him Zombie Boy. He is so happy in his life. He committed suicide. Took his own life. Killed himself. People like that, they never find satisfaction. They never find happiness. They never find peace. And they have been drinking the poison of dragons. The poison of dragons will cause you to do certain things in your life. So their wine is the poison of... So it uses the term dragons. So do we believe that this Bible is right? Because then it says the cruel venom of asps. Well, an asp is a type of serpent, very poisonous. Do we believe in that? So can we believe the Bible's telling the truth when it uses the term dragons? Yes, we can. Because we know that at one time, these things roamed the earth. They have, for the most part, I guess, died off. And so we don't see much of it. There are uh, reptiles in some of the Asian areas, the Komodo dragon and so on. I mean, it's pretty big itself. And these things, if you've ever watched one of these dragons consume something, they like to do it in about three, three bites. Okay? Gloop, gloop, gloop. And they ate a whole pig. I've tried that before. <laughs> Back in the day. Amen. By the way, the Komodo dragon. Living dragon. So we have actually something with which to draw from concerning the poison of dragons. The Komodo dragon is actually a real living remnant, a dragon, a reptile, that when it bites, it's got poison in its mouth. They used to think that the dragon's mouth had a bacteria in it, and when it bit its, uh, its prey, that the prey succumbed to the bacteria and it made it sick. But now they've found out that there's actually poison in the mouth of these dragons. A new study has shown that the effectiveness of the Komodo dragon bite is a combination of highly specialized serrated teeth and venom. The authors also dismissed the widely accepted theory that prey die from uh, septicemia caused by toxic bacteria living in the dragon's mouth. They don't believe that anymore. So using sophisticated medical imaging techniques and international team, uh, so-and-so and so-and-so revealed the Komodo dragon has the most complex venom glands yet described for any reptile and that its close extinct relative, Megalania, that sounds like somebody married to Donald Trump, but anyway, <laughs> was the largest venomous animal to have lived. What happens is the poison, watch this now, the poison, when they bite the prey, they let them go. They just bite them and let, they'll bite a, a big deer or whatever and they'll let it go. Because they know, they can smell with their tongue, they know where to find it. 
when it dies. And it's not going to take too long. So they don't mind biting it. And if the thing gets away, they don't mind. Because we're just going to wait. Because they know that that thing's going to die. What happens is, in a lot of cases, that animal will simply bleed out. Because the venom in that dragon's mouth causes the, the blood to no longer coagulate. To seal up the breach. Takes that effect away. The life is in the what? It's in the blood. Now you understand the spiritual aspect of this. The serpent's poison in a church will remove the blood away from that church. The blood, my friends, is the reason why we're all able to be in here serving God, listening to God, hearing from God, living for God. It's in the blood. Amen. The blood is the life. Without the blood, there's no salvation. There's no gospel without the blood. And I'm sick and tired of preachers trying to take away the blood out of salvation. It's the blood. Amen. Amen. So that's, that's the, the target of the poison is to get that animal to bleed out. Um, we now have shown that it is the combined arsenal of the Komodo dragon's tooth and the venom that account for their hunting prowess. The University of Melbourne. Where's Peter at? How you doing? Melbourne. Amen. And smart people in Australia. A couple of them. And Peter's one of them. Amen. Amen. Psalm 58. Look at this. The wicked. Psalm 58 verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Some people are born. They're never going to be saved. They're never going to be right with God. The sad part of it is, some of those people end up being pastors. Church leaders. Teachers. Evangelists. Christian TV show hosts. That's what they end up being. And they speak lies. They say things that are not true. They say things that do not match what's in the Bible. So they speak lies. And look at verse 4. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. What did the serpent do to Eve in the Garden of Eden? He lied to her. He, spoke, he did not bite her. His poison was a different poison. It was the poison of his words. Paul talked about uh, the uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus. And he said, their word doth eat as a canker. And he's talking about cancer. And the word canker and cancer means consuming, eating. If you have a canker sore or if you have cancer, what's happened is there are cells in your body that when they duplicated or replicated, the DNA did not get written right. So now, instead of the DNA giving life to the body, the DNA is now lying and it's bringing death to the body. And it's replicating. Because there's more than one liar in the world. There's more than one church that's not telling the truth there's multitudes of them multitudes that say it's okay if you're gay god made you that way what do you say okay no way jose <laughs> but they're telling lies the poison is coming out of their mouth and it's going into the ears of people and it's killing them. It's not bringing life. It's bringing death to them. That's what the serpent did. The serpent, I mean, you look in Genesis 3. The effect of what the serpent did in Genesis 3 brought it, killed Eve and it killed Adam. Killed him dead. Took 900 years to do it, but it did it. The poison is the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear. Snakes don't have ears. 
which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. They don't, serpents don't make covenants. They don't have agreements with people. You can't talk them out of biting you. They can't hear you. They don't do that. Psalm 140, verse 1. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. Underline that in your Bible. We are at war. Are we not? You're gathered here together. Some of you fought a battle to get here this morning. Some of you fought a battle in yourself. You fought a battle maybe in your home. You fought a battle with devils coming on you. You fought a battle, but we are fighting a battle against the lies that are being told out there. The lies from churches, the lies from false Bibles, the lies from, from internet things, YouTube video, blogs, um, sermons that are online, people preaching things online that are not true, and people are believing that. I mean, think about it. In 1990, there was a flat earth society, but it did not have members globally. A little slow. You need some more coffee in you. <laughs> Nobody believed in a flat earth. Just a few kind of weird people. Boom. Here comes YouTube. And here comes everybody figuring out how to make YouTube videos. And now all of a sudden, there was like something on Drudge Report, like 65% of millennials, people born since the year 2000, are not sure of the shape of the earth. They're not sure about it. Be why? Because of the internet. They watch some goofy YouTube videos and these guys manufacture lies. They manufacture so-called facts. That's not, listen, it's not true. It's like the Mandela effect. It's not true. Nobody went back in time and changed words out of the King James Bible. It's the same Bible. But people believe that stuff. They fall for it. There is a strong delusion coming. Second Thessalonians 2. We got people now falling for weak delusions. Falling for anything. Because, uh, because it's on the internet. Because some guy made a YouTube video. That's right. They left the word of God. They're gathered together for war. And we're going to have to fight back. We don't fight back with violence. We don't call people names. We just give them the facts of the Word of God. Let people, let people make up their own minds. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. That's where God put the poison from a snake. He put it in their mouth, under their lips. He put it in their tongues. So when a snake bites, it brings death. When these people talk... And the people are believing what these people are saying. It has the same effect. It's bringing death and not life to them. Romans 3, verse 10. Paul used that same idea. Romans 3 is where we find out that um, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3, 23. But he sets up that idea by, by quoting Scripture. So in verse 10 of Romans 3, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And you ought to believe your Bible next time you start feeling good about how good you've been. Amen. The clock is ticking on your righteousness. Okay. Their throat is an open sepulcher. I mean, look at how this Bible is talking about death is in their mouth. Death is in their mouth. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. That's the wine of Sodom. The wine of Sodom is bitter. Brings a bitter, bitter life, bitter death. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Years ago. When I felt God was calling me to 
you know, to speak about things prophetic. I got invited down to a church in Arkansas. It's my grandmother's church, and I was scared to death. It's the first, first kind of prophecy thing I did. And I spent time with God, and I said, God, I don't want to tell these people anything that's not true. And it scared me. It scared me to think that I was going to say something that wasn't right, and I was going to have to go stand before God and give an account of that. That scares me. There has to be a fear of God in us, and we have to fear what God will do to us if we step out of His will and step out of line. Amen? So, if I sin, or if I do something wrong, there's a fear in me of what God's going to do to me, and I have to then relay that to the people that I preach to, to tell you to put in you one of the seven spirits of God, and that is the fear of the Lord. So that you also in your life will fear God and fear what God will do to you. As opposed to the churches I've mentioned where they do not speak any kind of fear concerning God whatsoever. God is a friend to everybody. God loves everybody. God puts up with you. You can, you can do whatever you want to. And they know. See these people. I know some of these people. And they know that they can go to these churches because they're never going to have their sin preached on. Never. See, these people think this one lady that I know that is a sodomite on her Facebook page, she's all talking about all about how she's a Christian and about how God does this and God loves her and all this stuff. She thinks and she was raised in a Christian home with biblical principles being taught her at an early age. But now she thinks that she can live this lifestyle and, it's, and God's okay with it. And she's not afraid to flaunt her sin in God's face. Not afraid of it. That's, that just don't work with God's people. Amen. If you don't fear God, there's something, there's something you've believed, you've swallowed the poison. You've been bit. There's even, Job said, I'm a brother to dragons. SpaceX. They have, this is Elon Musk's company. He's the guy that started PayPal and got filthy rich. And he decided to use his money in a different way. So he's building spaceships. And the one that he sends on a regular basis to the International Space Station is called the Dragon. Now I want you to think about that. Isaiah 14. I will ascend into heaven. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. That's what Lucifer said. I will be like the Most High. That's what Lucifer said. So you have, And there is a dragon. There is a capsule. Part of the International Space Station is that there's a capsule attached to that space station called the Dragon that sits there and it's like their emergency escape module in case something goes bad up there, which any number of things, they should never put me on a space station. I will flip some switch every time and blow that place up. I will electrocute a whole lot of them, amen? But there's a capsule there called the Dragon. And why did he call it that? It's a spirit in this world. And it's called the prince of the power of the air. And it's the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Anybody that's lost, anybody that's not saved, anybody that's not right with God, you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. You don't have the seven spirits of God in you. You have a prince, a palate in you. And it's the one telling you what to do. It's the one telling you what to believe. And you just do what it tells you to do. You're not, listen, you're not free. You're not free from anything. You're in, you're in worse bondage than you think us Bible believers are in. Because you have a very evil, bad spirit that when it tells you to sin, you sin. When it tells you to lust, you lust. And it tells you to drink that, you drink it. it. You just do whatever. How many of y'all used to be under that one? Raise your hand. Everybody. That's everybody. 
Now, I don't do this often, but this interests me. There's a word in your Bible that the translators chose to translate it in different ways. And I like this. It's the Hebrew word tanin. Everybody say tanin. tanin. That's good. Now, that's just the word that's used. And it's used they, in one place. They translated it sea monsters. In another place, like in Genesis 1, they translated it whales. In another place, like in Exodus, they translated it serpents. In, I think in, in every place you find the word dragon in the Bible, the, the Hebrew word there is tanin in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's dracon, draco, the dragon. But the Old Testament, every time you find the word dragon, it's tanin. And so what the Bible is doing here is linking these four things together for you. So I don't, you know, I don't use the Hebrew to change what's in your Bible. What I see it as, as God is giving you a little wisdom and he's showing you that all four of these things, sea monsters, whales, serpents, and dragons are all linked together. And there is actually something that, that is common with all four of these. All right. Uh, I've got it in here somewhere. I'm not sure when it is. But I'll, I'll tell it to you in a... Well, I'll go ahead and tell you now. Do what? Just go ahead and do it. Let it out, huh? Just pop that pimple. All right, here it goes. Whales, serpents, dragons, snakes, lizards. Their genetics, and I can't remember the term, but it's in my notes and we'll see it in a little bit. There are some creatures that grow to a certain point and they stop, like humans and dogs and kitty cats and mosquitoes and flies and deer and cattle. There's something in their genetics that they grow to a certain size and then they stop growing. Sea monsters, whales, serpents, and all reptiles, including the dinosaurs, do not have that in their DNA. As long as they are alive, they grow. And they never stop growing. Am I right on that? Okay. Uh, cedars are that same way. I have a I have a bigger list that I'm going to show you a little bit later. But what binds to me this word tanin, what links them all together, it just happens that all of these types of creatures, I remember the term now, indeterminate growth. That's the term for it. Humans have determinate growth, meaning that there is a certain size that we're going to get and we don't exceed that. But... Dragons, serpents, whales, sea monsters, dinosaurs, they all have indeterminate growth. As long as they have plenty of food and plenty of space, there's nothing in them that makes them stop growing. You've seen probably on YouTube these humongous pythons in the Amazon or wherever, in the jungle somewhere. And they're that big because they're old, they survived, they had plenty of deer and people to eat, and they just kept eating, and as long as they kept eating, they kept growing. All right? Now, this I'm going to make a point of this when we get to the giants. There's a link. Dun, dun, dun. Okay? Sea monsters always fascinated me. Dinosaurs and sea monsters, creatures, sailing vessels from ancient days. These sailors reported seeing creatures. And they drew what they saw. Now, some of them 
can't be trusted. I get that. But the, really the only surviving record that we have of some of these animals is in the reports of the sailors that saw them out in the ocean while they were sailing from place to place. And they drew pictures of them or they made mosaics of them. Here's one in particular that caught my attention. Notice that, and it's large, it's a large sea monster. These five men sitting on its back, I don't know how real that is. But what drew my attention with these was this particular sea monster has breasts. And that's weird, right? Until you read Lamentations 4.3, even the sea monsters draw out the breast. In your King James Bible, God told Jeremiah to write this down, that even sea monsters, and the word here is tanin, they draw out the breast. I'm not aware of any kind of reptile that feeds its young that way. But somebody in history was aware of a certain sea creature that did exactly what the Bible said they did. And they give suck to their young ones. That's what these particular tanin sea monsters do. Now, again, I'm not aware of any sea creature like a whale that currently does this now. But in history, according to both the eyewitness account and your Bible, God said some of them did. So can we, and my whole point of this whole weekend is, can we believe what our Bible is saying? Or you're reading it and say, obviously it means something else. So if we look to the Hebrew, we could retranslate it to make it say something else that makes more sense. Or why don't we just believe the way it is and we find out that God was right the whole time. Here's one, a plesiosaur that kind of matches the description of some of the accounts of these sailors sailing in their vessels. Remember, we read about Leviathan, did we not? And we read about his, uh, Job 41 talks about his scales. So he had scales like a, like a snake or a serpent, he had s scales like a dragon, and he lived in the water, and he, when he sneezed, balls of fire shot out of his nose, okay? And so, did we believe, do we believe the Bible? Yes, because in ancient history, there are reports of things just like this. We have the skeletal remains of various creatures that could match that description. One is a plesiosaur. This is a Japanese fishing boat that pulled the carcass of something out of the water that looked like that. They took pictures of it and threw it back overboard because these Japanese guys were going, that's going to ruin our fish. Although they said it in Japanese. Didn't say it the way I said it. Uh, here you go, Peter. Australian Aborigines drew a picture of one that it looks like they killed it. And if you look closely in its stomach, there's a man in there. It ate one of them. And I don't know if the guys are jumping up and down and holding their spears because they're angry that it ate it or they're dancing and happy because they didn't like that guy. Thank you, sea monster. We didn't like him anyway. Okay. And by the way, there's fish and turtles and little snakes in this drawing as well. So apparently they saw one. So did these guys. They drew what they saw. This is a mosaic that somebody made. 
Here's a, an event happened in Cape Harbor, I think it's Massachusetts, Cape Ann Harbor, 1639. There was a story about this creature that they saw at Cape Ann Harbor and somebody drew the picture of what everybody saw back then. Okay, here is uh, a clay model from Mexico dated about 200 AD. Looks like a plesiosaur, a sea monster. So now we, have the, we go back to the word tanin here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 21, and God created great whales. The word there is tanin. And again, this particular creature, whether it's whales or serpents or dragons or whatever, they have indeterminate growth, meaning they can grow as large as there is food. Now, uh, if you look in Jonah chapter 1, turn there, do we believe that Jonah was in the belly of a whale? Now, we're told that that's not possible. So obviously, this is a story in the Bible that is not true. I cannot believe that God would lie. I can't believe that. I don't believe it. I'm not allowed to believe it. So what I see in Jonah chapter 1, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself because I know I had this in my notes here in a little bit, but in Jonah chapter 1 verse 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. So whether the fish was able to do it naturally or God had just prepared one special whale to do this, either way, I don't have a problem believing that God opened up the inside of a whale or some sort of tanin that swallowed up Jonah and he lived inside this whale's belly for three days. Now, was that the most comfortable place to be for three days? No, because Jonah called it the belly of hell in verse 2 of the next chapter. Okay? I'm in the belly of hell here and I'm pretty sure it smelled like hell and it felt like hell. Amen? Now, uh, and here, here's another interesting thing, and we'll take a break and we'll let Southern Rays have it, okay? In Exodus 7, Exodus 7, the word is tanin, and that word is the type of serpent that Moses' rod and Pharaoh's magician's rod made. Tanin. There's another word in Hebrew for serpents and most other places in the Old Testament where it uses the word, where it mentions serpents, it's using the other Hebrew word, but here it's different. Here, the word used is the same word for dragons and sea monsters and whales and serpents. Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh and they did as the Lord had commanded and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. Now that always interested me. Moses laid down his rod, it became a tanin, it became a serpent. Pharaoh called for his magicians and his sorcerers, and when they came in, they laid their rods down, and they said some sort of magic enchantment, some sort of spell, and their rods became tanin. It became serpents or dragons or whatever it was. That's what it became. And so Pharaoh's going, aha, I got you now. For they cast down every man his rod and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod, I like the wording of this Bible, swallowed up their rods. You know why I like it? Because it sounds like death. And the serpent is who has power over death. Death is swallowed up 
in victory. You see, that rod is the rod of Jesse, who has the seven spirits of God. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That rod is Jesus Christ. And he swallows up the power of the enemy in victory. Somebody say amen. Woo! Amen. That's good stuff. So you probably should not use dragon's blood on your face. Just say it. Okay? Probably should not use dragon's blood on your face. Okay? All right. Let's take five. And let's hear from Southern Raised again. Give the Lord a hand today.